Hi, my name is Francis McDonald, and I am CEO of Lyft Power. And Lyft is a exploration company. We are focusing on looking for hard rock lithium deposits in Canada. And we have three projects in the portfolio, uh, two in the Northwest Territories and one in Quebec. Well, I get to have you on board, Francis. Uh, like, we wanted to speak to you because you've kind of come out of the gates really strong. It's 350 million market cap company um, out of the gate. Uh, people are excited about something. We wanted to find out a little bit uh, why. Um, can we just start off with you? What's your, what's your background? You've been at the company for you know not so long yourself. So where have you come yeah. from? Well, I'm my my experience in training is as an exploration geologist, and so I spent the earlier part of my career with Newmont, and so I've got a strong gold background, and also looking for base metals in in Africa. And then in 2016, I co-founded a company, Kenorland Minerals, and Kenorland is a project generator focused in North America. So we were basically staking ground and convincing other people that this is where the next big deposit is and you need to come and spend your money here. And so we were looking at gold and copper to start out with. And then eventually we started branching out into other commodities and lithium was one of them. And so how Lyft got started was we had some ideas in Kenorland about where lithium pegmatite should be in the James Bay region in Quebec. And this was before the lithium run came before Patriot Battery Metals found the Corvette deposit and, and James Bay went nuts. Uh, so we staked a huge amount of ground and that got vended into Lyft. And that's how the company got started. Right. Okay. Okay. So um, we I think what I'm sort of intrigued by is, you know, how you kind of construct because you've started, um, you know, by like, you know, staking really kind of early, type, early stage type stuff. I'm interested in how you go about constructing the company. I guess it starts with the people. So let's talk about some of the people you kind of wrapped around this story. Um, so the company, I think we really have to go back to the Kenorland side of it because that's I didn't know anything about lithium. And, you know, I, my background was in gold and base metals. And so how I got interested in lithium was I was looking at how many meters of drilling goes into different deposit types in Canada in order to get to a feasibility study. And for orogenic gold deposits, so vein, vein gold deposits, it's 500,000 meters to 2 million meters of drilling to get to a feasibility study. Porphyries, you're looking at hundreds of thousands, you know, 250 to 500,000 meters of drilling. And then lithium pegmatites were like 20,000 to 50,000 meters of drilling. And the one that I always go back to is the Wabuchi deposit, which was Namaska lithium. And in 2017, they had a four and a half billion dollar NPV on the feasibility study, and it was based off of 50,000 meters of drilling. And for me, that was just like, like lithium pegmatites. This is the best bang for your buck that you could be that you can get in exploration. And so, like, I really didn't know much about them. But one of our shareholders in Kenorland had been managing a lithium fund. And so I just started talking to him about lithium and showed him the ideas. And he was like, this is open ground. Like, just stake it and we'll put it into a new company. And so that's how it started. It was really just a, it was a vehicle for Greenfield's exploration for lithium pegmatites in Quebec. And then it kind of morphed into something else down the road. Um, and so the, to get back to your question, the people that we brought in, it's, it's, it's grown organically i would say um alex langer is someone that came in very early and so alex has a background in lithium he was vp of capital markets for millennial lithium which got sold to lithium americas i guess uh a year and a half ago and it was through alex that the the yellow knife project came in to lift and you know as we were looking at trying to get this yellow knife project into the company um the company has grown, I would say. Well, well, it has. Um, but it talks about. I'm trying to intrigue about who does what. Because I'm looking, I'm looking at the the management team, and you've got a, you've got a, you know eight eight people there, um, and you got you know you got directors or helping el elsewhere. Like, give me a sense of who does what and what have they been tasked to do. What's important for the company to deliver? Sure. So right now, the the flagship for the company is our Yellowknife Lithium Project, and 
that's what's driving the valuation. I would say we're we're that's we're not getting value for anything else in the portfolio, which is fine because this is the most significant asset. And just to give a real quick elevator pitch on that, these are lithium pegmatites that are sticking out of the ground. It was called one of the largest lithium resources in the Western world in the 1970s, and so and you can see a path to that this would be a world class lithium resource. So we are going out and we're doing a big drill program. We've budgeted about 45,000 meters of drilling. And so in doing that, there's a lot of stuff to do. So Dave Smithson is the SVP of geology and Dave and I had worked together before. Um, he was also at Newmont. And so I have faith in the technical abilities of Dave. And so he's kind of the top of the technical period pyramid. Um, April Hayward is another recent addition and her role is chief sustainability officer. And that is a very important role in this company, just because these pegmatites are, they're right outside the city of Yellowknife and they are in the backyard of both the city, but also of the first nations. And so this is going to be, these people and these groups are key stakeholders for this project going forward and they need to be on board if the project's going to be successful. So April's uh, mandate will be environmental permitting and engagement. And it really is one of the most important roles in the company, I would say. Um, and then we have additional people, myself, Alex Langer. Um, Alex has a capital markets background, so he's helping out on that front. Carl Verley is VP exploration. Um, he was has a long history in the territories, and so we have we have a team of three geologists, but we are doing a huge amount of work this year, and it's really just kind of managing all of that technical side that uh, is that's we need some firepower there. Right. Okay. So you, okay, there's there's some of the people. Um, we know what you're going to do. You just told us forty five thousand meters, um, and um, that that's a lot of work. How have you gone about, or have the three of you gone about targeting where you're going to be doing this drilling up at Yellowknife? Well, it's pretty simple because, like I said, the pegmatites stick out of the ground. You can go on Google Earth or Google Maps and zoom in, and poof, there they are. Uh, and and this is one thing that you know people always say, "Oh, we have pegmatites," and and I get shown a lot of projects like, "Oh, we have pegmatites," and it's like, "Okay, great." Pegmatites are everywhere, but do they have spodumene in them, which is the lithium bearing mineral? And these specific pegmatites have been known about since the 1950s, and they've been explored for lithium since the 50s. So there's a lot of historic data that shows exactly where the lithium is. And so the targeting is very simple. We're just drilling underneath the best channel samples that have been completed in the 1970s. And these are pretty systematic. You know, when they stick out of the ground, it's easy to just go ch -ch 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 and and sample them on surface. So that's that's the targeting strategy. Drill underneath the best lithium numbers at surface. Okay, I'm, I'm actually looking. I think it's a present uh, one of your presentations that um, actually shows the the vis visible um, pavement sites sitting at surface. It, it is a case that you can see them um, from aerial shots. Um, nice. Um, but again, you still have to be, you still have to, you know, analyze that. So is there, so is there historic data that you're able to look at or is this truly Greenfield stuff that you're saying, well, it's so obvious, let's get going and we'll assess it as we go along. I mean, how simple is it? That's as simple as it is. That's, that's it. You know, I mean, there is historic data and there is historic drilling data as well, um, where, They've drilled underneath, you know, 50 meters below surface. They're getting similar grades to what you see on surface. And there's one specific case that for me is really, um, it kind of shows this. And one of the pegmatites is called Kai. There was a drill hole 50 meters below surface in the 1970s. It hit 16 meters at 1.36% lithia. And then 10 years later, there was a 230 kilogram bulk sample right on top of the drill hole at surface. And in that 230 kilogram bulk sample, the grade was 1.38. So two different programs, they hit same grades um, within 50 meters of surface, I would say. Right, okay. So you, you've raised some money recently, um, some, what was it, 35 million bucks to um, flow through? 
Yeah, that's right. Right. Okay. And that obviously covers you for your 45,000 meter um, drilling. What, what else are you going to be doing? So in Yellowknife, I mean, obviously the drilling is the biggest thing. Um, we've been, we're going to do a lot of surface work as well because we do have the exposures to, you know, go back over the historic work, get our own numbers. We'll do channel samples as well because they can be used in a resource calculation if they're, if they're 43101 compliant. And we're doing a bunch of geophysical surveys as well, and not necessarily for targeting, but it's really just to understand what we can use to find these things. Because the thing in Canada is that no one's ever really gone out and, and given a concerted effort to finding lithium. It's really just been stumbled across when people have been out exploring for other things. So it's an exciting place to be in as an exploration geologist, just because no one's looked for it. And we want to try and understand how to find these things and, and get ahead of the curve. Right, and and so based on based on where you are, though, have you got any restrictions in terms of um, weather or you know drill seasons, etc.? Not really. So we'll be doing a heli supported program this summer, and I guess the only restriction would be in this time of like let's say November till January, and we we could. We could be drilling during those times. Uh, that's the freeze up period, but it's also the time when the daylight hours changes quite a bit. So that's always the restriction is if you're doing a heli supported program, when does it become uneconomic because you can't fly during the night? Um, you know, if you only have, let's say, eight hours of daylight when you can fly, does it make sense to keep drilling? So we'll probably shut down around the end of October, wait for things to freeze up. And then once things are frozen, then you can just drag the drills around and and drill for another four or five months. Right, and then you, you, you've indicated at the, at the beginning that you know up to fifty thousand meters should see you through the feasibility study. Typically, on average, for lithium projects, is that what you're hoping here? I think Wabuchi was a special case, just because there was a big resource within a small area. I don't. We won't get away with fifty thousand meters. It might be a hundred thousand meters. Um, you know, in that ballpark, I would say so. But the goal here is that we're taking all of the exposed lithium pegmatites that we see on surface and we are going to drill them off at 100 meter centers. So 100 meters along the, along the dikes and then 100 meters in the vertical direction as well. Drill them down to 300 meters vertical and that should be enough spacing uh, to get us to an inferred resource estimate. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And um, then the thing is, I, I'm aware of a few other projects I in the district. So, um, you know, I think there's a slightly loaded question in the sense that, you know, infrastructure, access, lots of water, but there's also lots of roads, rail, et cetera. So for you guys, what does this look like um, initially in terms of setting up camps or need to set up camps, et cetera? Sure. I mean, the infrastructure side is really important for these type of deposits. And that's because when the product that you ship out of a mine here would be a spodumene concentrate and spodumene is the lithium bearing mineral. We want to concentrate it down. So it's, you know, we get as much lithium into the concentrate as possible, but to make a spodumene concentrate, it takes about, let's call it seven to 10 tons of ore to make a ton of concentrate. And if we're talking about, let's just use a hundred million tons, cause it's an easy number. Like if you have a hundred million tons and you're mining that, that means you're shipping, let's call it 15 million tons of material somewhere. And so 15 million tons, that's a lot of gravel that you're shipping. So these deposits don't really work if you don't have good infrastructure, uh, just because of the amount of material you ship. And so in Yellowknife, we're really, we're in a great spot. This is one of the best areas in Canada for spodumene projects because we have road access. So that's great. We're about between 20 and 60 kilometers outside the city of Yellowknife. Um, and then the other thing is rail. So when you're shipping material like that, you want to be close to rail or a port. And there is rail access in Hay River, which is to the south of Yellowknife. And we're quite a bit closer to rail than most of the spodumene projects in Canada, I would say. So it's a good place to be. Um, people don't necessarily think of Yellowknife as as good infrastructure people think of the territories as being in the middle of nowhere but the thing is it just really depends where and being close to roads and rail is the key i would say right and again so like given this program that you've got lined up i, I assume um you just want to get on with it but is it kind of are you doing it in phases you talk about being able to assess the 
data as you go along? What, what does it look like over the next sort of you know twelve months? Yeah, so I mean, it will start in phases. We're starting with two rigs, and then we're going to scale up to six. Um, but that's going to happen pretty quickly. So by let's call it four to six weeks, we'll be scaled up to six drill rigs. And this is, you know, how do we deal with the data? I mean, you have people that have dealt with big data um, collection programs before, and this is Dave Smithson. You know, we've we've done this together um, in a company or in resources, and you know, it's really taking a big company approach to this. And so, as long as you have all of the systems dialed, you can deal with this. And and we've got we've had time to do this. We're we're all set up to do it, and uh, we're just going to be churning data out, but also digesting it in real time. Right. And, and what what and, and with this data, what, what do you think you're going to need to talk to them on? Because you you shot out of the gate quite. Uh, quite quickly, people are excited about the way that you've told the story, the way you've laid this out, and the and the fact that the simplicity of it. I I, I guess you would say, um, but the data that you're now going to be able to start putting into market is also super critical because they're going more in both ways for you. So, what, what what do you want that to look like? What does that need to look like over the next twelve months for for you? Just in, you know, not just in terms of grades, but the way the way that you you go about laying out the plan as it were for how this thing builds and then the growth story comes from sure i mean you know with this project it's it's quite special just because the things stick out of the ground and so what i've been telling people is like you know look i can justify saying you know my tonnage that i see based on the information we have is is around 95 million tons i can't go out and arm wave that there's 200 million tons here you know it's 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 just not possible unless you say that each pegmatite goes from this width and it doubles in in uh, the vertical. So how do we display the data? I mean, I think we're just going to be very transparent about it. And we don't necessarily have to be promotional or arm wavy. And it's really just saying, like, this is what we have on surface and this is what we hit below it. And, you know, for us, there is going to be a lithium resource here. It's just how big is it and what's the grade? It was kind of interesting. I was thinking about a handful of Canadian lithium stories. I say not many, not many of them uh, at all. Um, where do you position yourself in, in terms of the your, your peers in Canada? You know, and what does that mean for you in terms of a, a North American offering for, for, for lithium? Because again, it's, they're a bit scarce in um, you know, North America too. Sure. So... The easiest thing to point out is Patriot battery metals and the Corvette discovery is incredible. The thing looks like a monster and they've had a lot of success in the market. So they've been trading, you know, I think at the highest point it was up to around 1.6 billion. Um, the deposit looks incredible, but this is, I think that's the, the, the peer that we'll be with, you know, and we can come out with something that's of, of similar size, I would say. So I think that's where we can go. There are a lot of Canadian lithium stories right now. And the thing is, is most people are looking for the pegmatites and they may have a showing. It might be two, three meters wide, but we have lithium pegmatites that have been known about since the seventies that are 30, 40 meters wide on surface. So it's just, it's a, it's a different league, I would say. Um, and you know, the ones in Canada, Patriot, Frontier looks incredible geologically as well. And then I think Yellowknife is is the next one to come along. Right. So focus is all about Yellowknife. The other couple of projects take a back seat for uh, now. Um, when do you start drilling? Tomorrow, June 1st. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all righty. Okay, we're off and running. Well, um, look, we're... I appreciate, Francis, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I was intrigued by you know all of the the attention that you were getting, and um, looks like you've got something on your hands here. Um, and we'll be following you for sure as soon as, as soon as these drills start, start coming through. So um, stay in touch and let us know how you get on. Okay, absolutely. It's going to be a fun ride this summer. So I hope everyone tunes in. <laughs>